Please, please take the call, James. Uh, actually, our reporting secretary is on. Okay, would the please take the roll call? Yes, sir. Uh, Joe Harpy. Here. Anthony Gonzalez. Nancy Capello. Here. Chris Miner. Kevin. He's here. On. here. Thank you. And the mayor just arrived. Okay, thank you. Thank you. As far as Anthony's concerned, <clears throat> excuse me, did you get my note about him? He's gonna be out of town, he couldn't, uh, okay. All right, we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge of Allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we'll move the agenda <clears throat> me, for public participation on the agenda items. Any member of the public would like to uh, speak for us or raise your hand if you're on Zoom and we'll line you up uh, on the uh, Zoom unit. Don, unless you prefer to stand, whatever. Just please. John Bashan, 56 Maple Hill Avenue. Uh, I know you have a lot bigger fish to fry, but by now you might have seen my um, this little quirky thing that's been bothering me in the agenda. It's in that C410, uh, right, of referendum on ordinances. So um, I'm pretty convinced that uh, it should read um, three, the, the exception should be for 375 or less uh, because you have these levels of spending in, in this uh, special appropriations between uh, 375 and 975 is this, you know, semi-discretionary area for the council. The council could spend up to 375 with no uh, ordinance, no no delay in passage or anything. Over 975 is automatically goes to the referendum and it's this little area in between. And I don't even, it's probably never even come up. James, maybe you know, did, has anyone ever petitioned for a referendum? I don't believe so. I've never heard it either. Mm. So that's why I say it's kind of quirky and nerdy. But the first time I read it right away, I'm like, oh, that's obviously wrong. And then other people did not agree with me. Uh, so I said it was a typo. So maybe it's not a typo, but I guess we have to determine what's <laughs> the intent, what the intent is, because, uh, you know, um, it just seems to me that the council can't. And I may be I don't want to interpret what that um, whatever it is, 408 or whatever it is, the <clears throat> yeah, obligatory referendum stuff but to, the way i read it is they they can't spend over three they can't borrow over 375 without a referendum even though that upper limit 975 that's on that special appropriations thing so i may be wrong on that but so i just think and and i think i provided the the section of weathersfield's uh uh charter where they use the word specifically they use the word less and so they have an in between amount too the part that goes automatically to referendum and the part that the, the council has full discretion over it. They could spend without any special um, ordinance or without the ordinance. So just wanted to throw that out there. And like I said, I know you have bigger fish to fry. Um, maybe the best way to determine that, I've I've given the evidence of what Weathersfield does. Maybe we could look at a couple of other towns <clears throat> and that might help to, um, you know, guide us. That's okay. it. The finance Thank director will be uh, speaking with us this evening as well. So she's going to review um, a host of issues related to things that we discussed. And then we'll evaluate all of those issues and um, perhaps uh, make some recommendations ourselves as mm -hmm. we move through the process. I mean, while I'm here, I had another one about the emergency ordinance, if I have still time. I don't know if you have a time um, limit here. And, and it's just a little bit confusing. I think the purpose of an emergency ordinance is obvious is that they could, uh, the council could discuss it, you know, raise it, discuss it and vote on it and pass it in one session. I'm not sure if that's the intent, but I would think that the whole, the whole nature of what an emergency is, that that would be the intention. There's some things that conflict with that. And I, I don't have the exact number, but the passage by ordinance 
it says any ordinance has to, um, it, it sounds like to me, the way it's worded, is that that ordinance can't be, that that um, that can't be discussed even at the meeting that it's raised and it has to go to another meeting. It doesn't have to be publicly noticed. It doesn't have to have the waiting period, obviously, um, but it can't by the terms of one of the other sections, I think it was 405 or 406 or something, that it can't be even discussed. So in other words, they can't vote on it that same night. I don't know, I have no opinion on what it should be, but I'm, I suspect that most likely you would wanna have the 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 um, latitude to vote on it that same night, if it's an emergency, if it's an well, actually again, emergency. Again, the finance director will be going over that area as well. If you have time to stay, if not, you can see it later on. Yeah. This is a recorded program, so. And also the fact that there is no limit on our emergencies too. And I see other towns, they set a limit on what, what emergency spending can be. Okay, thank you. Any other member of the public wishing to speak? We do have Councilor Minor with his, with his hand raised online. You want to recognize um, him. Okay, I was going to do that under comments by commissioners. I'm not sure if he had some other comment. His, his okay, hand any, has been up for Okay, if you could hold that, Chris, for comments by commissioners, I want to see if there's any other member of the public wishing to address the commission. Do you have two individuals online? And if you're calling into Zoom meeting by telephone, dial star nine, raise your hand to be recognized. Use star six when recognized and speak by telephone. State your name and address for the record. And who do we have? Nobody with their hand raised. Not going to admit to it, hey? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we encourage members of the public to participate because that's important to the commission. This is your charter. We're here to uh, take your recommendations uh, under advisement and to either make a recommendation or not on certain items. Uh, there'll be a draft report that will go to you, the people, initially for your review before the council even sees it. And then that'll come back to us and then we'll issue of the first draft to the council. The council will evaluate that. We'll have a meeting to see if we're all on the same page or we have many pages and they want us to add or subtract some things and we'll discuss that amongst ourselves. And it's up to the commission what action it wants to take. And then the council itself will have a public hearing so the public will see that before they make a final decision. And then if they do move it to referendum, the public, you, the public, again, will have an opportunity to vote on these items, yes or no. So not putting any pressure on the public, but uh, they have some work to do on this. Right, Mayor? <laughs> okay. Um, seeing no other public participation, hands up or hands down, comments by commissioners? Commissioner Minor. Mr. Minor. No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to confirm that I was here. I'm sorry, I had an audio problem when the roll call. Okay, thank you. I'll entertain a motion for approval of the minutes, the March 15th, 2022 special meeting minutes. So moved. So moved, second. Any discussion? All those in uh, approval, all those uh, favoring the reported minutes, please say aye. Aye. Any nays? The ayes have it, the minutes are passed. Okay, we'll move on to discussion of items charged for review by the town council. Uh, discussion of charge number five, number nine personnel, town manager and superintendent of the schools are here to discuss that. Is the town attorney on board? He is online with us as well. Okay. Um, Mr. Ancona, would you like to review this for the commission and members of the public as to why we're discussing this this evening? Yeah, I, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am not entirely sure why it was a charge, but I do understand that there is some some confusion regarding the authority regarding um, classified personnel within the Board of Education that are under the purview of the town manager. And uh, I know James uh, disseminated a, uh, an opinion letter that I drafted in April of 2020. And I'm hoping that you guys had a chance to just take a look at that because it does, it does explain a fair amount of what's happening and um, it does explain the charter provisions. 
So I, 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 I don't recall seeing that. Printed. Oh, we're going to see it now. Oh. <laughs> All right, thank went you. on the printer and I forgot to put it on the table. All right. Well, it's probably not something that you're going to sit there and read right now. Um, but if we want to take a minute, that's fine. It's just a silly well, a number of us are speed readers, but I think that we would do you a disservice if we put you on hold. So you can go ahead, Ben, please. Okay, so what we have is uh, under Article 9 of our charter, we have uh, Merit System, Classified Service, and basically Personnel Director. That's 901, 902, and 903. And under the uh, Classified Service, uh, they are, they're all, these employees are under the purview of the town manager, except not, uh, except the certified employees of the of the Board of Education. So that leaves a, uh, a, cross, a crossover between the, the town personnel and the Board of Ed personnel. And, and there's been, um, I don't want to say uh, a conflict, but it's been, um, where, where do these people belong? Do they belong with the town manager do, or do they belong with the superintendent? And I think the charge by the council to you guys is to sort of make that decision or not, or at least clean it up. And I, I think we don't know what the, the right answer is regarding personnel or running a town or a board of ed. All I know is legally, these employees are under the purview of the town manager at this moment. Okay, so um, what we got initially was the uh, state the Connecticut State Board of Labor Relations back in uh, 1994, initiated in 1992. And to follow up with what the town attorney is saying, just for discussion purposes, and then we'll turn this over to the manager and superintendent of the schools for their input. Article 9 of the Charter, Charter clearly places non-certified employees of the Board of Education in the classified service of the town. Section 902 sets forth the role of the town in creating and maintaining the classified service system. This section states that it is the town council or the personnel director of the town who will create job descriptions for each position in the classified service, establish the minimum qualifications for each position, create or delete positions within the service, create a plan for each position, prepare a set of personnel rules which must include a procedure for promotional exams, administration of the classified plan, probationary periods, hours of work, vacations, sick leave, and other leave removals, and all other rules pertaining to personnel. So, uh, Ben, are you saying that, that that part of it is still confused? Well, I'm not confused by it, and I don't think anybody else is really confused. I think the question is, uh, are we going to leave that? Or are we going to make a change? Is there a desired change? I don't know. I mean, to me, it's pretty clear. Uh, Non-certified employees are under the town manager. Okay. Are there certain groups of, are they the same groups of individuals in positions that were named back in the day? One was the transportation manager. I don't want to, you know, go into the superintendent's position. Well, let me do this. Um, Keith, could we get your feelings on this? Your input, please, Tom. Yes, Anderson. yes. I was uh, involved in the decision of the State Labor Board back in 1994. Uh, and it was clear to me that the only certified employees that can be recognized standalone from the town council and town manager is were the teachers. Uh, because the only way any other employee could ever get certified would have to go through a process with the town manager and the town uh, human resources director to have certifications included within job descriptions, which has never been done. The Board of Ed, however, on their own, without consultation or authority, from the town started getting their own job descriptions and required certification of employees. Uh, we now currently have uh, our attorney, labor attorney, uh, prepared to go to the state 
labor board once again mm -hmm. to have these uh, three unions that were that were created through this certification program of the Board of Ed have those unions either uh, thrown out or uh, put under the town manager and town council. Um, this was decided in 1994 very clearly by that decision and it has been abused and ignored by the Board of Ed over, I guess, the last 18 years that I've been gone. Uh, so when I came back to the town as a town manager, I was quickly realized that there was something wrong because they were negotiating, the Board of Ed was negotiating with classified employees that they have no right to be negotiating with. All classified employees fall under the town manager, not the Board of Ed or superintendent, according to the 1994 decision. So uh, we have, I think, three unions currently that were formed, in my view, inappropriately and illegally, that um, the council will be having an up, a brief briefing by the labor attorney coming up probably next month to make a decision whether we pursue having these three unions uh, over, over uh, eliminated or have them uh, become part of, again, part of the town uh, classified series, but these certifications that were added on to these employees should not have been done. There was no way it should have been done. All of the negotiations for classified series employees have to go through the town manager. So the, the creation of these three unions was improper. <clears throat> we, we probably will be challenging that in the short time. Okay, thank you, Keith. Superintendent of Schools? Yeah. Sure. Do I speak into the microphone? Yeah. It'll pick, It'll pick you it up. Will, okay, yeah. Yeah. okay, I'm not sure which. I know one union that the town manager is referring to is the um, non instructional administrators. I don't know which other two unions that he's referring to. The, um, the nurses is one. Okay. Then you have the 085 certification that yes. somehow got traded. And then there's another one, I think, that has two or three people in it. I don't remember. I think there's three in total, though. The nurses, uh, I'll quickly address the nurses union. Um, that was something that came about uh, right after I began working here. The nurses petitioned to form a union. We met with the town manager at the time as well as the town attorney at the time, and they agreed that those that union would negotiate with us. So that did occur. Um, I, one of the things that's part of the charter somewhere is that the town manager retains control over classified employees unless they are delegated to the superintendent. At the time, admittedly, a, a different administration so that was the previous town manager. She did. We met with her. We met with Brian Giantonio. They were quite eager, actually, to have us negotiate with the nurses. So that is what occurred. That was probably in 2000. Yes. Okay. And I'm joined by Steve Farisi and Lou Jackmowitz as well for any uh, backdrop, because obviously that was uh, right as my <clears throat> tenure began. So that's the nurses. I don't know of any other union other than what um, Mr. Chapman referred to as the uh, 085 union or the non certif non um, instructional administrators. The key element there is those individuals are certified. They are certified by the state of Connecticut. They possess what's called the 085 certificate, which I'll pass out to the commission. I did not make enough copies for everyone, but I'll um, ask James maybe. Um, there are a few extras. But the 085 administration, and it's the one that's circled on the, toward the bottom of that page, specifies what positions would require that certification. And the four individuals that are involved have that certification are the director of security and residency, the assistant business manager, the director of food services, and the director of technology. 
Initially, when this uh, union formed, they also included the director of transportation. He currently is not in this union. Uh, and I'll, I'll get into that in momentarily. So this is- oh, Excuse me, are those teaching positions? No. They're not. These, okay. But the state of Connecticut has many layers of certification. Ironically, back to the nurses discussion, school nurses have petitioned the state of Connecticut to get certified like, uh, like teachers, like uh, administrators. So that may be coming, but that's a separate issue. But that these things sometimes happen without you know, our control. In this instance, though, the positions uh, that those four people possess all require the O85 certification in order to function in their job. Um, and if you, I mean, the print is terribly small on this no, handout, but yeah. you know, they have some, you know, they have to meet six out of the, um, is it eight requirements? 11. Well, 11. So if they need to have, if th their job requires them to do six out of any of these 11, then they must possess the O85 certificate to do their job. And we've reviewed this time and again, and they do need it to do their job. And um, that is why they have it. They formed a union um, in 2018. It was recognized, there was a proper vote held. And at the time they determined that the certification was necessary. And that's how we've proceeded since 2018. In fact, we are negotiating with that particular union now at, earlier this evening. And we did have members of the town council sit in on that. Um, but they are, you know, for all intents and purposes, we've hired them, we evaluate them, they have to have state certification. All their job responsibilities are under the purview of, you know, my office or my designees. So that is where that is currently standing. Um, I mentioned earlier there is an exception. The director of transportation is not currently in that union. When he was hired, it was right along the time that this union was being formed. Uh, when the district went out to search for a director of transportation, this was before my time, about a year and a half to two years before my time, uh, there was not any qualified candidates that had the certification. So the uh, union at the time agreed to sign a memorandum of agreement saying, for now, that individual doesn't need it. But if he were to vacate that position, the next person coming in has to have it. So I've provided for the commission the memorandum of understanding that specifies that one individual does not need. So for you, I'm sorry, and your next door neighbor there, Mr. Bora. So th those are really the pieces that we're aware of at this time that supports. Um, again, we're not contesting the charter. It clearly states that. The town manager oversees employees unless they are certified. And I think um, if the nurses is the issue, then, you know, again, that was deferred to my office by a previous administrator, a previous town manager. I, Mr. Chapman clearly has a different uh, management style. So I'm not sure how to turn that around. I think that may be a labor board issue, but I'm not sure because the folks that the nurses union was formed lawfully in concert with the town at the time, and they are currently a sitting union under UPSU. Um, so that I suppose would be a labor board matter, but the certified folks seem pretty straightforward to me. So do these positions still exist uh, <clears throat> that were stated back when, back in the nineties, transportation supervisor? Yes. And is that position under the town? Currently he is because he is not a certified individual. But does he report to one of your people? Right, and that's the interesting, confusing point too about uh, Newington is while there are still many employees that are officially under the town and the town manager, they are 100% board, they do all their functions are with the board. Right. So it's just a, an interesting um, nuance within Newington. As, as I did some research in preparation for this evening, this is kind of an unusual arrangement. Most towns now have the board handles their employees, the town handles their own employees. Uh, Newington is one of the few communities that still manages it this way. And there are a few others Not re recently an example is Middletown did used to run this way. They recently said, you know what, board, you do your stuff, town, you do your stuff. I don't hear, I don't know that that's part of this charge. But what I'm saying is this is an unusual arrangement because it, some of these employees that are officially town employees don't really ever work with the town. 
And that would apply to um, building maintenance and custodial supervisor and director of cafeteria, are those positions still existing or are they- Custodial retired? and maintenance position exists, but it is not in this union. He would still be under the town. Um, but who supervises him? Uh, Lou Jack Mowitz. Yeah, it's it's not the char charter commission's position to uh, get into any kind of a conflict in terms of what our position would be or to sustain or substantiate. We're, we have no question about the integrity of everybody here, so that's not the issue at all. Our charge would be if something's in conflict with the charter, then it's either fixable or it's not fixable within any recommendation we can make. And that's what the council and the mayor are asking us to do, come to some conclusion, whether we're gonna make a recommendation or make a note, we didn't make a recommendation because it's not something that can be created by a change in the linguistics of, of framing the situation. Would that be correct, Ben? Yeah, I agree, Mr. Chairman. Um, and there are, certain, there are certain substances here that really probably shouldn't be touched by this commission until the labor board has made a decision. I mean, okay. these, these particular unions are in question. Well, perhaps that would be the footnote then for our not making perhaps. a specific recommendation. Do you gentlemen have anything you'd like to add to it? Or? Nothing more to add unless the questions come up. Okay, Keith. Yeah, the only thing I would say is that if, if you back up the clock, you can go back to 1994, it is reasonable to understand that all of those people that were under the town council and town manager could not have legally entered into negotiations with the Board of Education. The only one that they can negotiate with would be the town council and the town manager. So they, they, these, these unions have been created under false pretenses. And the, the problem that I see is you have several people that aren't in the union. You have, uh, I think it's the building facilities guy that didn't qualify to get in or something or other. I mean, who do these people work for anymore? You know, half of them are working supposedly for the Board of Ed and support to the Board of Ed. And, uh, then the other half still are uh, considered town employees. And, you know, one of the differences is that uh, any employee that's within the classified series of the town, uh, it, it is the town manager that makes the decision on if they are terminated for reasons, not the superintendent. So we get into a whole slew of, of questionable behaviors that should not have happened since the decision was issued in 1994. That was the charge, that was the issue back, if you remember, Joe, I think you were on the council at the time. Uh, there was an attempt by several board of education employees to create a union, which the town employees did not want. And the majority of the people within that classified series voted it down. And how we got to where we are today, I, I don't, I can't explain. I did immediately upon my return, notify the superintendent that I felt that it was not proper uh, to negotiate with this, with this group, but she continued to negotiate with them. So we are where we are now. So I just have one other question. How, how do you negotiate salary with these people if, the structure of salary range was created by the town. I'm just curious. Um, Should I come up? Yes, please, Steve. That's your, that's your bailiwick. Yeah, I would sit up here if you like, Steve, or whatever. Uh, I, I well, I'd be a couple of <laughs> Thank you so I much. I can't give a seat away, Mayor. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, before you. So um, it, it, to, to kind of... Um, reverse and just share a little bit about where it started and then to your question how do we negotiate salary um both uh the petition to negotiate uh for our nurses 
and for our non-instructional administrators who hold an 085 certificate through the State Department of Education, uh, both um, were presented to the town when the petition came through. Uh, the town decided to delegate that to the board at the time and appointed a town council member to each of the negotiations that occurred. So we negotiated in good faith like we had to through the State Department of Education uh, and through the petitions that came through to us. Uh, you have to meet the timelines outlined in those or we would be um, outside of the legal confines that we had to uh, adhere to. Um, so throughout that process, we, uh, in good faith, uh, negotiated the salaries and the arrangements. Uh, once those were negotiated, uh, we presented all the information along the whole process um, to the board, to the town, uh, and then they were approved by both. So we continue to engage in that process. These are uh, for our nurses and for our OA5 administrators, the two separate unions that are being discussed. Um, they are two new contracts. So we are still in the first iteration of those contracts. Right now, uh, we just held a meeting in the other room prior to this. Um, where we are now renegotiating with our 085 uh, non-instructional administrative group, of which two, count, two town councilors were appointed to be a part of that negotiation process. Um, and so that's how we continue to determine salary and benefits and all of the contractual rights that they, they acquire through that process. All right. Does anyone have a question? Kevin, you have anything you want to ask? Or... Chris, did you have any questions? Chris Meyer? Nancy? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so uh, we appreciate the time uh, you took to come down and um, we'll continue to, to look at things. But again, it's, it, the commission can only make recommendations on things that, are, that would be within the charter's purview and control. Uh, and it appears that um, there has to be some other discussion on this and um, Keith, did you have any summary you wanted to give us on this? Or? No, no, I, I think, you know, it's been explained by both sides. And, and again, uh, I'm new coming back. I wasn't here to agree to anything other than I don't believe that it's uh, proper to disregard the charter in this, in this way. Um, you know, classified employees that were working under the town to not just arbitrarily decide they want to get certified and become uh, negotiating under the Board of Education. That is, that is not an appropriate method. And that was tried back in 1994 and uh, it failed and it should remain that way. Okay, thank you. Ben, any last comments? Thank you. Okay. Well, right, thank you again. Appreciate your time. <clears throat> thank you, thank you. Uh, Chair, are, you, are you looking for me to stay on for any other topics? If you'd like to, sure, you're welcome to, but if you prefer to get off, Keith, whatever you decide. Yeah, if, if there's nothing uh, specific, I, I will probably leave. Yeah, we're not going to take any votes or make any decisions. We're still in the accumulation of information, and we just wanted to get the finance director's input on a couple of issues. Okay, thank you very much. Have a good evening. That, that I sent you a copy on. I think you have yeah. that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Take care. Thanks. I will. <laughs> Mr. Chair, can I make a comment? Absolutely. You know, I agree <clears throat> with what you said about this. That, you know, it's certainly not our role to adjudicate whatever dispute is going on right now. Um, but I, I think it does make sense for us to look at the charter language and to figure out you know, what makes sense for this community going forward, right? right. Obviously, we're not here to relitigate the past or do any of that. And so um, it would be interesting to hear. I know some folks talked today about what Middletown, recent changes in Middletown. I think the superintendent mentioned that or what neighboring communities do so that we can clarify uh, these roles. So going forward, we don't have similar disputes. And I think we have an opportunity now in reviewing the charter to do that. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman, can I, yes, Mayor, I, go I ahead. Just, I just wanted to offer when I was reading the charter language when this all kind of came up, so not taking one side or the other, but just the language itself. Um, I guess when I looked at it, thinking of when the, and I don't know exactly when the language was drafted, but clearly it was before 1994. 
So I guess as a certified teacher myself, I look at it as <clears throat> was the what was the intent of the language when it was drafted? And my and this is really surmi me surmising, but I would guess that the intent was that certified staff referred to teacher certification. Yes. And now right. since that time when the language was drafted, there's a difference um, where there are certifications that yeah. don't fall in that realm. And I think that's where the crux of the issue is. Those other certifications would have always been considered non-classified. They, you know, they wouldn't have fallen under certified because yeah. certified, I think the intent was teacher certification when it was drafted. So I think that's where the, if there was language to be cleaned up, that would be, would you specify that it'd be teacher certification versus everybody else or how you would look at that? But yeah. I'm just offering that as a perspective. Historically, I think perhaps the intent should be looked at if you were looking at the language, but. And most of the towns that I looked at, and you mentioned Middletown, Kevin, and that in particular had this similar language in terms of classified service, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And whenever they got into this 085 or whatever Keith was referring to is when they made some adjustments to it to make mm -hmm. room for that. So that there were a number of charters that were in conflict with that provision of certifying non-teacher. Because that's why I asked the question of these instructors or teachers and they're not. Right. Like Department of IT people and things like that. And that really changed the dynamic. And I can see why the town manager would be um, concerned about it because the charter clearly states one position and they've created a buttress over that somehow. Uh, and I don't know if it was poor advice on the part of whoever was looking at it legally or yeah. or whatever the decision was. You know, I'm not, we're not here to condemn any previous yeah, no, no, council. Yeah. But, yeah. well, that was helpful. I, I found that helpful actually. You know, because you couldn't pick that up from reading these documents. That was something we weren't Just aware to hear the nuances of. Until the yeah. superintendent brought it to our attention, right? So, okay. Uh, let's see where we're going now. We have uh, Janet Murphy, the finance director, to go over section 408 uh, and some other items related to referendum dollars. Janet, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Sorry, I, I I had to do a little running around, so I'm on my cell phone. That's all right. No problem at all. Uh, we'd like to get some input from you on the um, 408 obligatory ref referendum and ordinance and uh, specific to, as you know, from conversations that you and I have had on the phone, where we can get comfortable with increasing the dollar level amounts and straighten out some of the language if that need to be done on this particular section. And um, can you give us a sense of um, what the index was? Was there an index consideration when the, these original numbers that appear in the charter now uh, were set? Um, we're just trying to get a sense what the benchmark was to create those numbers that, that indicate when you have a special appropriation at X number of dollars, you're gonna to go to referendum or you're gonna have a special election. I know that came before your time probably, but can you give us a sense from your own read of it? Um, it, probably, it probably at the time, they, there was a good reason for the numbers that they were using. Um, I have looked at other towns and other areas regarding what uh, they have been done. A lot of places do a certain percentage of their appropriation um, instead of setting a specific dollar amount for it. Right. So um, that might be uh, something that you might want to consider. We are well within the realm of what other towns have been doing. Um, it's, it's not uncommon, these dollar amounts, but as I said, I think sometimes it might be a better idea to do a percentage of your total pro budget appropriation because as expenses go up, your budget goes up, these limits go up, and it kind of might make it more realistic to what expenditures you're experiencing. Okay, so on that point, the commission would like to know, speaking on behalf of the commission, um, 
what kind of an index would you be comfortable with since you're going to be living with what we recommend if the council picks it up? I mean, is, is something pegged to the T-bill rate, something that would work, 2.5%, 2.84% on the 10-year T-bill as an index to follow over the years and leave it um, at that? What they what they typically do, most towns will do, is it's a percentage of your, your total budgeting appropriation. So it's not tied to the T-bill. I wouldn't tie it in any way to the market. Um, I would tie it more into what ex uh, expenditures you're actually experiencing within the town, which would be your total budget appropriation, if anything. And I've never seen any town go over 1%. Okay. Because I saw, it might have been an out-of-stater that had it might have been West Hartford that had 30%. 30% wow. um, of what? I'm sorry. I don't recall. I thought it was of the general fund budget. 30% uh, yes. of the general fund, that'd be quite high. Yeah, um, well, I, was, I don't, I don't know that you'd want to go that extreme with no, it. I, no, that's what I was... We were talking amongst ourselves. That's a little too... Uh, because if you're if you were doing that thirty percent and and in yeah. the general fund budget is is not counting the board of ed is yeah, yeah that would that would be yeah no he wouldn't want to go there yeah what, what we were discussing in general amongst the of where it's a percentage something two and a half percent somewhere maybe one two and a half percent depending on where the discussion went and I know I think it's. Um, Plainville or Enfield that uses uh, the tax lien, they have a percentage. Well, we'll get into that discussion. They probably uh, do it uh, maybe a percentage of their grand list. Maybe yeah. they do something like that. Yeah. So Chairman. that would be the index that you would recommend as a combination I would, of some. I would want to tie it to somehow to your expenses or your revenues because that's what we run the town on. So as those go up or go down, that should be our limit. Okay. Well, that's very helpful to us. So Weathersfield actually has an example of that in their current charter, which, where did it go? That's not cooperative. That is not I think Weathersfield and Cromwell both had it in theirs. Yeah, they have. The, uh, why is it not coming? There we go. Based upon what type of appropriation you're looking at, anywhere from 0.15% up to a 5%. For electors, hold on, where am I? Um, oh, that's sorry, that's a petition. So they, they're putting in a 0.15% appropriated yeah. general fund expenditure. Okay. So, Janet, uh, the, uh, the, com the commission's a little concerned about how this language reads excess, but not, not in excess, as it, as it was brought up from a member of the public and things. Can we get rid of those kind of words if we send a percentage, just a flat percentage? Um, well, as yeah. I'm reading, as I'm reading this, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to flip it open again. I'm seeing what? it's kind of two separate issues. So you've got okay. the you can't do bonds or notes in the amount of 375 or less. You can, but otherwise you got to go referendum. And the other one yeah. is a resolution making a special appropriation in excess of 975. Yeah. They're two different things. They're not, they're not saying in between this and this. They're saying you can't go out and borrow money more than 375000 without going to resolutions the way yeah, I'm so, reading it. So my question would be, is that, would we have to find a new bellwether for that 375? Do you still need that to make things work? Do you still well, need the I, language, yeah. no resolution authorizing the issue of bonds or notes other than notes in the amount of 375? Yes, yes. I mean, would you want to change the limit? Of course you could. You could make it the same as a special appropriation if you wanted to, um, now, but you would you, definitely still have to have it in there. Okay, so what do you use that for, if I'm just like, curious? Is that, do you go out and borrow when cash is a we, little tight and you're waiting for We don't, no, we, we don't, we don't. That's why I'm saying it. When we don't, it, because we have the CIP account, we only go out to bond for extremely large projects. We don't go out for anything that, you know, is it, it typically it has to be like a multi million dollar project for us to go out to borrow or bond. And that or, would apply to, would that apply to bands as well, right? Yes, it would. Okay. 
No bond anticipation notes. All right, well, that. Lean, yeah. Not now. Can okay, try us? now, Mr. Chairman. Jokes. <laughs> Janet, can you still hear us? I can hear you now. Oh, okay. okay. We got kicked out some reason. That was strange. <laughs> we thought you got mad at us about something. We weren't sure where we were going. <laughs> no. Chris, are you still there too? Yeah, Chris is there. Okay. Yep. And yeah. he has his hand raised. Okay. Um, okay, so um Mr. Miner, did you have a question? Yeah, just quickly. Uh, I think with you know Weathersfield as the example, we we're talking about bonding. They commonly bond for road projects. It's a very regular occurrence for them to pose bond questions on their election cycle. So I think they're a lot different than we are in terms of how mm -hmm. they their budget funds. But I was curious to see if there was any language, Janet, on the special appropriation versus budgeted appropriation. That's just, is there any way to clean that up or clarify it? Or, no. I, I, I totally agree with you on that because I think we, and we got into this discussion when it came with the town hall, that special appropriation is different than when we get appropriation approved through budget process. And I think somewhere in there that language has to kind of state yeah. that a special appropriation does not apply if we actually go through the budget process to approve an appropriation. All right, I think that's important to clarify just so there's no Definitely. indication yeah. moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. To go to Chris Miner's point, the attorney, uh, town attorney gave us a definition of special appropriation, Janet. Uh, defined as any appropriation other than, and he recommends that this to go, goes into any new language on 408, by the way, a special appropriation defined as any appropriation other than the main support appropriation in a budget act or adoption. A special appropriation is not included as part of the annual budget process. How Perfect. do you feel about no, huh? that? That that's, That sounds good. Okay, because the commission would consider including that in any recommendation language. Um, mm, sounds good. And we'll go with that. Okay, so um, to go to uh, one of the members of the public's question on emergency ordinance, would you review uh, that section 409 and give us your take on the, the language in that? Second. Do you, do you have that in front of you? Yeah, I'm just looking okay. through it right now. <clears throat> C409. Yep. Mr. Chair, just one comment while Janet's going through there, yes. if I might. Yes, yes, Mr. Minor. Yeah, the only concern I would have with that, and I know that Mr. Bashan had referenced possibly a cap or something to that de degree, but it, you know, speaking from experience, unfortunately, when that need arises, it's a, a necessity that a, a decision and actions are taken immediately. And I think we got to be careful to not be too tight on that, maybe to clearly define what an emergency <laughs> might be, but I think that's going to be tough to do. Okay, thank you, Mr. Minor. Janet, did so you get a chance to? 
Okay. So I'm reading through 409. I don't know what questions you have for me regarding finance on that. Well, I, I think we pick up on some of the things that Mr. Minor just related to and member okay. of the public. I, I did see, I think it was Plainville it's an emergency. that did have a percentage uh, attached to the emergency ordinance. Uh, and it was a it could have been a percentage of, I thought that's where I saw the percentage of tax liens. One percent yeah. of tax liens. It couldn't. No, I saw. I mainly usually see that in special appropriations. Okay. So they did attach some percentage to it, but you're saying that would be a mistake. Is that what you're saying? To attach one to emergency ordinance. Yeah, yeah. To put any kind of. Because I think what the public is saying is, how do we know where that would go? Yeah. I mean, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, yep. would we be borrowing our legal limit <laughs> to make it work? Or, you know, you know, yeah. at the extreme, to be yep. extreme. Or we'd be, uh, you know, somewhere in the middle. Where would, be, where would we be? And I, I, the commission understands the sensitivity of this, that the council doesn't want to have its hands tied if it has to act like that great spill that took place not too long ago. Um, yep. So would any language in there be of an assistance like um, within 15 days after the declaration of the emergency, but no later than you know, within 30 days, but, you know, no later than 30 days, a special meeting would be required by the town council to hold and review the status of the expenditures to date and the projected expenditures on this project. Somewhere between, you know, the 61, certainly before the 61 day drop off that we're aware of, but. Yep allow the public to get involved. Not that the council wouldn't. I'm just saying to make it something that they'd have to adhere to. What do you think of that? I I, I wouldn't have any issues with it. Okay, because the commission has kicked that around and I just wanted to bring it up on behalf of the commission. Um, there was a, I have a, a question on a C811 borrowing to meet emergency appropriations. Now, I'm not sure why it's down at HC11 and why it's not connected to the 408, 409, and why it finds its own place in the charter. And uh, the C811 borrowing to meet emergency appropriations in the absence of un any unappropriated funds to meet the emergency appropriations under the provision of article well, we're back to CO. We're back, back to, to CO. 408. Yeah. yeah, back to 408. To, um, yeah, 4, 408. And then the council may be res resolution authorized the issuance of notes, each of which shall be designated emergency note. Is that what, is that what happened during the fuel thing? That was we, didn't, we didn't get to that point because we had other avenues. We had other funds available to be used. But that was one of the ideas that was kicked around during the fuel, the problem with the fuel spill. So okay, um, then, that's then, where it would be play. Okay, and then it says the emergency note <clears throat> may be renewed from time to time, but all such notes of any fiscal year and any renewals thereof shall be paid no later than the last day of the fiscal year next succeeding the fiscal year in which the emergency appropriation was made. I mean, so, I don't know how pertinent that language is to the rest of the things you're looking at. So so basically what it's saying to you is um, you have to get approval through either the budget process or referendum to actually finance to pay that off in the next year. Okay. So, so it makes sure that it's nothing too large that your budget or some other financing can't get approved to cover it. So we should have the public okaying that then somewhere in here, right? Either a referendum or well, special election that again? Way or through, either that way or through <clears throat> budgeting process. Yeah, I know. We'll look at that because it seems to me that thing should be connected somewhere in that group of category of discussion. 
kind of hangs out there and you catch it as you go through the hole. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions for Janet? I'm going to allow, go ahead. Uh, you have a question over, go ahead. A member of the public just wants to ask you, and it's such an important issue. I'm going to allow it, Janet, so appreciate okay. it. So, John Bichon, 56 Maple Hill. Thank you for that opportunity. I was going to wait till the public uh, participation again, but I'm glad that she's still here. So there's a lot of confusion, and, maybe, and I'm sure that some of you are not confused at all, but for the general public, there's a lot of confusion over what's a uh, special appropriation? What's a, a loan, a note? These limits are a little bit confusing. And so just to uh, address what, um, I'm sorry, I don't know her name. Janet. 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 Um, that there, I think she was referring to what um, I had wrote to you, that there is no in between, but that there is a specific range in between on the special appropriation side. And it specifically says that the range between 975 and 375 has to be passed by ordinance. And no, passed by um, ordinance. If you, if you read it, which section? Um, are you well, the beginning of it. 408. If the, yeah, if you're looking at 408 and you read the beginning of it, it says that issuance of bonds or notes other than notes in the amount of 375 or less and no resolution making a special appropriation in excess of 975 shall become effective until the same time as the approved by a majority of the qualified election vote thereof at a regular election or referendum called by the council for that purpose. So they're two separate things. They're notes or bonds in the amount of 375 and a special appropriation in excess of 975. They can't do either one. Yeah, yeah I understand that. And then it goes on to uh, mention this area in between. Um, well, less it ties any special appropriation. Yeah, you're right. Or less, but an excess. That wording seems contradictory to the beginning of it. You are correct. Well, this is specific to a special appropriation, and this is where I get a little bit confused. To me, a special appropriation, at least I'm starting to believe that a special appropriation is not a loan. It's it's money that we have available. Right. And, and so mm -hmm. um, so I think that the, the council has some discretion there where they could propose an ordinance uh, in that range between 375 and 975. It has to go to ordinance. I mean, it has to go to the ordinance process, which calls for the public hearing, the public meeting, and the 12, especially if it gets passed, the 12 day, or whatever it is, 12 or 15 day, um, I call it contestment, which I looked the word up, it's not a real word, but uh, the contestment period, um, and, and that's specifically for ordinances for the public to have an opportunity to petition to get their 5% of the electorate to petition for ordinance. That's what, that's the basis of my argument. And again, I know you guys have a lot bigger fish to fry, it'll probably never come up, but the first time I read it, it just jumped off the page at me. That, that's not right. It's, it's just, it's not right. So, and then um, about the emergency ordinance, I fully agree with uh, Mr. Harpy about the, because um, uh, I never even saw that section at 811. That should be somewhere mixed in with the 400s here with this section four, because that is important. So, and, and, and I'm acting like I know what I'm talking about here, but on that emergency ordinance, the, one of the things I was uh, concerned about is um, how would that, gets passed. So it's called an ordinance. And, but if you go to 405 introduction of ordinance at the end, it says, um, no discussion shall be had upon a proposed ordinance at the meeting, which it is introduced. There's no exceptions in 405 that allows that, um, even emergency, which again, I don't really have a strong opinion on this. I just believe that the intent would be that you would want to be able to discuss an emergency that evening. It's an emergency and vote on it. Um, it, it doesn't, it can't go to, um, it doesn't have to be a public hearing, but it's suggesting that it does have to go to another meeting. And um, I'd be curious what your all, what all of yours opinion is on that. Again, I don't have a strong, uh, I'm not, I'm not, um, you know, one for one or the other, but I would just assume that that's what it's for. And then, so again, um, I'm just confused about that. Uh, I'm not that confused. I think I'm understanding it a little bit better to, you know, the 375 is, over 375, that the council can't propose borrowing more than that. We always thought it was 975, but the 975 is just on the spending special of, appropriation. Yeah, special appropriation, the money that we have. So, you know, they could spend up to 375 yeah. uh, in cash, 
or in uh, or they could borrow that without a referendum. And so that's why I keep saying that in between, I call it the in-between range. And Weathersfield does actually use, have a limit on their emergency uh, appropriation, I believe, I think it's zero, uh, 0 0.3 or they have a range of 0 0.15 to 0 0.3 for that are in between 375 and 975, which was in that one ordinance that I, I provided the clip to. So <clears throat> it seems kind of small, that number, but again. Um, yeah, we're going to look at that too, you know, we'll evaluate it. All right. Thank you, John. Okay. appreciate your comments. Uh, Maureen? I'm okay. Maureen, yeah. <laughs> it's been a day in names for me. I apologize. I respect everybody. That's <laughs> just a long day. Janet? Uh -oh. I lost her again. She's still here. She is. She on mute? I there just unmuted myself. Yes. Okay. Can you go to C813 competitive bidding? And look yep. at that. $30,000 figure, does that need to be reevaluated? Uh, in your opinion? I look at this. We want to make sure we stay within the state numbers. The state's at 50. I prefer not to go too close to the state numbers. That way, we're saying we're doing more due diligence when we get a state grant than even they do. Um, so, you could, of course, raise it, but I wouldn't go much higher than 40. Okay. And that's based it's just on what you see and that's, what you're that's dealing based with. on what I see and that when I get audited on a grant from the, that we get from the state and we do purchasing, I want to make sure that our requirements are even more restrictive than theirs, uh, that there's no question uh, that we're definitely following purchasing guidelines. Okay. I think that's essentially the items that the commission wanted to review with you. Um, and I think what we'll have to do is go to the town attorney or bond council for a specific language so that when we make the recommendation, the council doesn't have to be concerned that we didn't clear up the language portion of it yeah. and that you're comfortable with that. Um, Definitely. And um, I think essentially we learned a lot this evening and you were very helpful as always. We appreciate your time. Joe, can I ask no you? problem. Yes, the mayor had Jan a question. Jana, hold on one second. Just yeah. it, when, when the first discussion tonight when we were talking about the 975 and you mentioned possibly changing to a percentage. Yes. I'm kind of equating that to what we did with CIP where we switched from an amount to a percentage, right? Correct. So in looking at, so I'm looking at like the page one of our budget, just trying to figure out what figure we would look at for that percent to be of. So percent of what, what would you recommend? A lot, a lot of towns do a percent of their total appropriation. So but, that that total appropriation line, all our expenditures. Oh, I see it. Okay, so total appropriation, town and board. So right now, that's in the manager proposed the one thirty two nine zero three nine sixty eight. Correct. Okay, correct. Okay, I just want to make sure when we're looking at it, we kind of have an idea of the amount and what that looks like. Yep. Okay. Thank no, you I just for think clarifying. It'll make life a lot easier, and then you're not tied to a specific number, and you can adjust Definitely. as you move on. Yeah, it's really okay. I think that's about it. Thank you very okay. much. Appreciate Thank you, guys. Again. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye. 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 So, Mr. Chairman, I actually just wanted to address emergency ordinance yes, uh, effectively. So, really, I can see this one being changed as a topic. Specifically, what this ties into is what's called an emergency meeting under the general statutes under 1-200. So there are three types, regular, special, and an emergency. Emergency does not require prior notification of any actions that in that same meeting you can take necessary actions. And in this case, it could be the passage of an ordinance in order to preserve the health and safety of the town. That's one of the reasons that this specifically sunsets after 61 days. You wouldn't expect that type of an emergency go, going on that long. So if you were to make it shorter, I think it could curtail what the council needs to complete okay. to protect the town itself. But I do think we could clean up that language a little bit more just to make more sense. Yeah, and I, and I think that from talking to, to commissioners, we'd like to see 
and they, as I said before, the council will probably do it anyway. Uh, you know, a, a public hearing during this process, and maybe what happened in the situation you're talking about when they're discussing it, but specific to where they are on costs and what they anticipate the cost to be. Right. And, and at that point, when they're holding that meeting, they may not have yeah. any cost estimates. Yeah. They may have an idea where they may authorize, say, $5 million, yeah. if not a general fund. Maybe we get reimbursement from FEMA. I, maybe we get it yeah, from the state. Just, but to be able to have those <clears throat> funds available in that emergency situation right. is important. No, I, I agree with that. I'm just saying I think the public is sensitive to, you know, a runaway cost. Correct. Not that this council would do that, but I think that's what they're afraid of and really not know. And that's actually one of the reasons you know, that it's buying restrictive the restrictive but you have no is. idea what the price is because they took off the paperwork, you know, you right. just don't know. And it's a little... Yeah, well, it's disconcerting. And that's why it has the six vote versus the standard five right. vote. Yeah. So instead of a majority, you have a, a, a higher majority. Of, yeah. Vote. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, that's yes, good. Good information. Um, I'm somewhat concerned about cataloging all this information. I'm going to have to work with you, James, and then s disseminate that information to the commission on how we're going to move forward in terms of um, getting this all uh, put into the kind of framework we need to have it put into, and that we agree on the general language and have it, as I say, reviewed by council, either bond council or the town attorney or both, so that we stay within the proper statutory language, which is going to be critical here. Uh, in terms of how we put this stuff together. So we'll have to have a sit down on that. And you can provide me some transcripts provide of all me the meetings. Some guidance on that well. uh, would be very helpful. Yeah. So we can get that done. We, we've got 13 items. We all know that we've got to go through. Um, one that we're confused about a little bit is Parks and Rec. Now, uh, initially, uh, I forget, it doesn't matter which town councilor recommended it, but it came down with an 11 board member discussion. And then I don't think it's a secret, I received a call from Don Woods and yeah, Don well. said seven is the number and he was concerned about shrinking the number of board members. And I said, well, we're not in the business of shrinking or adding. We just want to have the right information to make a decision and a recommendation to the council. So <clears throat> that's one. Uh, and I don't know who we have come in, talk to us about that so that we get the right information or whether there's a split on the board about whether it should be seven or 11. Yeah, I thought the, the board took action on that or had a conversation. With what they we were did, told. and I found that out from Mr. Woods because we weren't made aware of that from the from the board. That that's they the had, only reason it was brought forward by the yeah. council was because we were told that the commission they requested did, it. They did take an action on it. They did originally. Yeah, I have, I've had multiple conversations with Mr. Woods as well as a superintendent of Parks um, regarding what it could look like or a proposed change within the charter itself. My recommendation, if we were to move forward, would be removing the specific membership in here, simply leaving the reference to parks in here, and creating the Parks and Recreation Commission under Chapter 8. That allows us more levity to be able to make changes to the membership of it without having to open the charter. That's in that idea. aspect, you can go. they could even make recommendations as to how they'd like to do it. It could be they want it as um, seven members with two or three alternates. That would keep all of their current membership in place. And yeah. then as everybody comes off, you know, maybe we determine we don't have the need for that many people and we make the change to the ordinance again through the public hearing process. So we just plug that as a recommendation to the council. Correct. So essentially for charter language, you could just say there shall be a board of parks and recreation. Which shall um, determine the uses of. You'd literally strike consistent. Just of. strike that consisting of piece. Right. Would you make reference to membership being determined under Chapter 8? Or you we could. Need to? So you'll notice they do say they're appointed for staggered four-year terms. We could leave that in there as a standard, or we could make a, a change. It could be five-year terms and three years for alternates. We could make any sort of a, a layout that we chose to, <clears throat> but we'd have the ability to make the changes if it didn't work for them. 
where right now, unless you open the charter, you don't make any changes. Right. You have 11 people. Right. If you don't have membership show up, you don't have a meeting. Right. You don't take any action and nothing gets completed. Yeah, just for the commission's understanding, that was truly just something brought forward, um, we thought, as a recommendation from the commission. So there was no intent for the council to want to change anything right. on that. It was really just trying to um, work with the commission on that. And he he didn't suggest there was any. He, he just thought Expressed there was an opportunity to keep it the way it was because they wanted to measure a, that they were getting a quorum of the last meeting or two. Yeah. They wanted to run it out over a couple of quarters and see if it made they could maintain it. Yeah, we've but, actually but had this question. answer with Zavid, I think. Yeah, I like that answer. That's a good idea. Uh, that yeah, they, be... they had some questions about possibility of changing minority <clears throat> representation in that as well, um, making it more of a, instead of a, say, a seven member board, a maximum membership on that is, God, I got to remember here, I believe it is six. It's a late night. <laughs> uh, Jane's brain is like a computer. <laughs> he just goes through the files and comes up yeah. with it somehow. I don't know. Let's see here. Well, let's go with a five. On a five member board, it would be four members that could be from the same party. Really? So, so I had to, yeah, five and two for a seven member board. So they were thinking about making it less restrictive. So you'd have instead of a, a five, a four, one, you'd have a three, two, so that you'd have more representation from both parties. It's not a requirement, but we actually do it under our current board of ethics. We require two members from major each major party, but three members from minor parties. So there is precedent to be able to make it in that same format if the council chose to go that route. Okay. Yeah, and his, you know, and he did express the concern it was tough to get people to volunteer again, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. from the time that they really and that that is a large commission to, it is to come out with. Any volunteers? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, wrong <Thanks> town. <laughs> Any member of the public want to go on first? <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Um, continuing a discussion on commission charges. I, I think we're making um, good headway on these things and the critical things. To me, it was a... a, a I'm glad that with the superintendent came in and Keith to discuss this because it's clearly we don't have any kind of a role to get involved in it until it can be resolved in other venues. I think the commission would all agree with that. There's a legal least aspect to this, which I think may be insurmountable at this point in time since it's up and running <laughs> and they've got, you know, Maybe something 10 years down the road. Yeah. Yeah. Um, next revision. <laughs> yeah. So I think we'll make note. Of, of the information we received at this meeting. Mr. Chair, why wouldn't we take the opportunity to clean up that language if it's causing uh, this kind of um, struggle, I guess, well, between the town manager and the superintendent? I don't know that we can clean it up. I think he's intending, to, he didn't say it, but the town attorney was, was considering, I think, taking some kind of an action. But I don't think that binds this commission. I think it could. I, I don't want to put something on the council that hasn't been sustained uh, by any potential act that the town may take uh, to either reverse it or get a, get an opinion. Because when they originally got into this battle, they wouldn't give them an opinion. And if they had gotten an opinion back in the 90s, one way or another, this wouldn't have happened but they dismissed it with no opinion. And- um, Well, there was a clear opinion on that, wasn't there? Uh, no, because we had to go through to the Board of Labor in order to get the oh, determination right. on yeah, it. Yeah, and I think Mr. Chapman feels pretty strongly about it. So, you know, we were not in the, and I understand what you're saying, and you're right about what you're saying. I'm just saying from, from a total picture point of view, I think that he may decide to do something about it or make an attempt to do something about it, or he may not do anything about it, but. Well, I think we should think about uh, the community and, and what, what makes the best sense going forward. You know, how well, should this be structured? I mean, they feel comfortable. They have this this action that was certified by the, I don't know, was Brian G. Antonio the town attorney at the time? 
I don't know. Was he? Uh, I believe Deputy? I believe the former town manager used Brian uh, for some labor issues. That he was not town attorney at the time. I'm trying to think. Okay, well, I guess he was involved in that. So mm -hmm. that that's set in law, and the law superseded the charter. And I don't think we can lend a hand in superseding the charter. I think the charter is clear about it. Um, I don't know. Let's talk about it. Let's think it about it. And let's talk about it. I wouldn't dismiss any ideas. I appreciate it. Uh, it's too bad, though, because you still have the charter language out there. And um, I don't know. Everything's changed. Certified used to be instruction position. That's what it used to be. That's how you got certified. Right. Right. <laughs> well, the other piece, I don't know if it was mentioned earlier, but the whole AFSME union piece. So right now the AFSME is considered. So there's AFSME employees on both the town and the board of ed side. Those are the ones that all fall under the town manager Correct. in terms of like. So, for example, if someone for whatever reason uh, came forward as needing to be dismissed from employment for some reason. Um, right now, the town manager would be the one to do that, whether they're a board of that employee or a town employee. Correct. So that's where um, his role is pretty solid and, and um, delineated and very clear, I think, in that when someone is dismissed uh, by charter, it falls under him if they're in that AFSCME union or in that non-certified role. I think what burns them the most is that the, they negotiate. I'm not saying they're wrong to do this because they've got <clears throat> the law on the side, I guess, but where they go in and negotiate salaries with these people when it, the charter clearly says that those are all designated by the town in terms of, you know, the positions that they're speaking of, the non-certified. It doesn't say they wouldn't recognize anything other, but it's. I think it's a, it's a matter of, I, I don't know, I can't speak for Keith, but, I, you know, if we get to the point where we recommend something, and I'm not saying we should or shouldn't, I just want to point out the struggle, I I would assume the town manager would recommend that you, you don't take it, but that's another, that's another, I could tell he feels very strong yeah. about the whole thing. And, Councilor Minor well, he wasn't, huh? Councilor he wasn't Minor brought into the discussion, so I understand why he's upset. Councilor Minor has his hand raised. Yes, Mr. Minor. Thank you, Mr. Chief. Yeah, thank you. Just real quick. To, James, do you happen to know roughly when that uh, negotiation changed with these three newly created unions? What period of time it was? I I just drawn a blank in terms of when it was. Say that again. I you broke up a little bit. Do you know when those period? What the time period was that the three unions were created? What that time frame was? Uh, well, the nurses one was in effect, then it was disbanded, then it came back into effect. I want to say late 18, that would be when Superintendent Brummett came on board. Um, the non-administrative instructional, non-instructional was, I believe, 2019 or 2020. I want to say late fall. No, maybe June. <laughs> Uh, I'm looking at the contract in my head. Uh, I think I believe late June on that one that had a, its approval by the um, bargaining unit and the superintendent's uh, action through the chairman. Um, on the third one, I, I'd have to look back at that one. I haven't looked enough at that one, but I know the, there was a renegotiation on one of those contracts. And I can't say which one it was. Okay, so relatively new then. All right, thank All right. you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. And I'd say the <clears throat> biggest sticking point that Mr. Chapman has is the fact that all of those positions are in the classified service. They're in our plan currently. Right. And because they were not requested to be removed, they still exist. So if that employee is in that position, we run in the problem of how can they be in a union and have a position outside of it in the yeah. classification plan? So well, we've had that classification no, plan in effect right. since the mid eighties. That, hasn't, that, that issue hasn't been resolved, no mm -hmm. matter what they've done. Because if you look at the old documentation with Dr. Ward, Dr. Ward said he always felt uncomfortable, even though these people reported to him, 
and he specified certain positions, mm -hmm. he was very uncomfortable negotiating their salaries because he didn't set the scale, right. nor did he set the qualifications for the job. Correct. The town yeah. council did the <clears throat> recommendation right. of the town manager. Yeah. So let's think about it. It's a, it's a good point, Kevin, and I, I want to be fair to everybody's opinion on what should be going and what shouldn't be going. So um, let's let's talk about it and think about it, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, I have one quick question, Mayor, about the removal of uh, individuals on committees, et cetera. Yes. Would you be able to tell us more specifically what you would be looking for from this commission? Yeah, I think in our experience, the council, the, the process that's in place makes a lot of sense if there is some type of reason to remove someone based on either behavior or ethics or, you know, something like that. It makes perfect sense to have the removal process that's stated because then the party at question has a chance to um, be heard and be part of the process. And that makes perfect sense. The, the real um, issue we have is that we don't feel that process should be needed if a person no longer qualifies to be on a committee or commission. So in other words, if someone moves out of town or, um, I don't even know other exceptions that I'd have to kind of deceased. think about. Somebody's deceased. Somebody's deceased. <laughs> Anything that would preclude them in any way, shape, or form from being on a commission without a letter of resignation right now, the only way we have to remove them is through that formal process of going through having the, the public, you know. Oh, the heavy it. duty process. It's quite a process to go yeah. through if there's a clear cut reason why the person can no longer serve. If they've moved out of town or no longer, you know, uh, a resident, those specific requirements that you have to meet. If they don't meet those, there should be a way to just simply have the council, given that evidence, say that we're removing them from that commission without going through a formal process. Do you think the council would be open to the suggestion of a percentage of meetings they would have to make to be considered a viable? Yeah, there is member. some language to that in the board and commission. I actually, we do booklet. have some in there. Uh, actually, I have some language from Weathersfield, which they actually have a removal procedure in their charter. Is that the 50%? Uh, this one is um, up to three regular, I think it's three consecutive meetings or 50% or yeah, more of the meetings. That's the one right. I saw too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they have a process that they can go through. And Sorry, go I can't see the language, but I mean, the three meetings piece makes me a little nervous only because if someone has a medical issue and for some reason over time can't attend for, someone might have a, a surgery and not be able to attend for a month if there's a meeting every week for some reason, right. you know what I mean? So we'd have to be cautious of that. Uh, right, but um, it, notice it says unexcused That's I can't, can't really sign them. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm happy, happy to read it through. <laughs> uh, let's see, uh, let me get a little wider. Uh, let's go up a bit more here. I'll agree to make such I understand. Really yeah, my context by this time of night are a little foggy. Yeah. Well, how about the 50%? How does that strike you? That yeah, is it 50% out of a certain <clears throat> period of time? 50% uh, or more meetings, whether regular, special, of the board committee commission within, within a, calendar a calendar year, year, which is similar to what we did inside of the boards and commissions booklet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that makes, I don't know. To me, that makes sense, If so, but that speaks more to someone just not upholding their end of the bargain, right. so to speak, as a commissioner or committee member. Um, so I'm not in disagreement with that. I think that serves a purpose. Yeah, but if you but the residency piece would be much I would I would hate to have a, a position unfilled for 50% of a calendar year, if you think of it that way. Right. Um oh, no. because you wouldn't be able to fill if the person has moved out of time, you right. wouldn't be able to fill it for a long away. period of time until it hit that threshold. Yeah. So you're more okay. interested in moved out of town or no longer meets the requirements to serve on said commission. Yeah, usually it's a move out of town, it's a ceased, yeah. some reason for that. Or yeah. for example, some of our commissions also require that, you know, like uh, standing insurance that you have a certain qualification or there are certain committees that require certain um, qualifications. So if you don't meet that anymore, you should be able to be removed immediately by the council as long as that has been vetted. So can you give us a copy of that? At some yeah, point, the only part not that I don't right now. agree with is uh, the same part that we pretty much have in our charter now, yeah. which is the bottom part where after such public hearing, if so desires, five days more or 10 days service removal, that's the process that we sort of end up with right now. Mm -hmm. So 
we need to find a way that we can make that a well, simpler then process. You, the softer process that you're suggesting wouldn't require <clears throat> the council to uh, go through the same steps it's going through for right some other dire issue you know right yeah unethical or whatever the situation yeah like i said i think that serves a purpose i think yeah. that it makes sense and we did have that instance have once in my tenure um, <laughs> um where we did go through that process and it made a lot of sense that we are able to hear both sides and know whether it makes sense or not you know there's always two sides to every story so that's um i think a good process to follow if there is a need for it in terms of unethical or some kind of behavior that's not becoming of the person serving, but um, yeah, I don't want to re keep repeating myself. I apologize. Okay, so um, and then, do you really want the a, a time to be in the charter for the organizational meeting? You guys are no, all actually, settled on seven. No, we you know we said seven o'clock, not even thinking about it, just because that's when our meetings always are. But just take the time out. I think that somebody brought that up last yeah. meeting, and that made perfect sense. Let it just be at the discretion of the of the current council. Nancy just that the organizational said, meeting. Nancy suggested ten thirty, but I said <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would just leave the language, and then it has to be held that Tuesday. At, it, it's the I think it's the Tuesday after the election, or whatever Correct. the language is, right? So I would leave that in and just take the time okay. out altogether, and then it's at the discretion of the current council. All right. Um, and then the library trustees, isn't the language already in there, James, that says it's a town council? I know, I see the town, I see town, and then I see town council. Yeah. They are an unusual organization for it. The council appoints six members to the committee itself. The rest are trustees of the incorporated library itself. There's a bit of ambiguity on how it functions. We, as a as a council, we've already always appointed up to six members, and we get notification of everybody who's on the entire board from the library. It's easy to follow through, um, but I, it could probably use a little bit of a tweaking. I would say. Mm -hmm. So should we have one of them come in or is uh, that something? We could have the, we could ask the chairman if she's available. I know uh, that Monday the Stam 11th, or? that's Diane Stam, correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or she could send um, one of her officers as well. Okay. Well, <clears throat> given the sensitivity of all those issues with the library, maybe it'd be a good idea to have her come in or whoever go through that. Uh, let's see if there's any other real now get to the town planner and police chief uh, on residency requirements. Presently, there is no residency requirement. Is that correct on either of those positions? But yet they both live in town, the current ones anyway. They do. Okay. We previously under the 90. Charter, I believe it is. Um, we had a residency requirement for the tax collector that's been removed as of 2012. So slowly they've all been coming out of the charter. If you were the tax collector, you think you'd want to live out of town. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's actually a recommendation that was made to our finance director as well by one of her predecessors who said, You never want to live in the town you work in as the finance director. <laughs> You know, I understand the attraction to a little bit of Mayor, Mayberry RFD, which is a healthy thing for any town or municipality. But the, with a police chief, I think he can't require his rank and file, right, by Correct. by law to, to have residency requirements. There may be police officers that would locate here, but maybe others wouldn't. So his army is somewhere else and he's a resident. I, I, I don't know what advantage we gain on that, but it's worth a discussion. Town planner, I'm not sure I understand that one. Yeah, and even our town, current town planner recommended not going forward yeah, with that, just based upon the fact that there is not a certification program specifically, and there is a very difficult time in getting town planners who do live in your town. You may end up going with a contracted position because you don't have somebody who is available. We'll write a referendum to store existing language and the timeline is properly outlined. 
issues with that? There is a little bit of a confusion in that one. That one's actually one that I recommended and the council went forward with. So under <clears throat> section 410, you'll notice that a referendum must be held when there shall be filed with the town clerk within 15 days of the public, uh, published notice of the passage of the ordinance, as Mr. Sean has noticed, uh, a petition signed by qualified electors in the amount equal to 5% or more of the total number of electors whose names appear on the last completed registry list, which petition shall be filed with the town clerk. Now, this is where it gets into the confusing part. Who shall within 10 days determine whether or not the petition contains sufficient numbers of valid signatures? And if it does, so certify to the council. The ordinance shall not take effect until the council has submitted it to a referendum, which shall be held not less than 20 nor more than 30. <laughs> except this referendum may be held at a town election or a general election if the same occurs not less than 10 days nor more than 30 days after the filing petition. You'll notice the town, town clerk is still working on it at that time, <laughs> which makes it really hard to put it to referendum. Lord. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. Yeah. So that's one of the little pieces that we really need to look at and just sort of break out on a timeline <clears> to see <throat> how it would work out better. Okay. It was interesting because I, I had a question regarding that, whether it, whether it was to a charter or to an ordinance, and I started reading through it. I'm like, that's not going to work. I, I, can't, I can't hold it and still complete it in that time period at the same time. So I'll, I'll look that over and I will send some language out. Okay. <clears throat> and the last one, review uh, language 609 for the auditor. I do have some language that I picked up from some other towns I'll share with the commissioners and you, James, that Perfect. I think will get us. Yeah, How many members are you looking for? I believe we only do it as three, and usually they are council. I know I've served on that in the past. Yeah. I unfortunately don't have access to my desktop, otherwise I would verify that for you right now. You know, you talk about qualification, but I think if you can get it, I think we should have somebody that's either been an accounting major or associated closely with governmental accounting as they can be um, to assist on that committee. Is if that they're going to go in. Language. You know, she doesn't have input okay. on it. Yeah, she, she actually made the recommendation specifically because we have an audit committee. Yeah. We have an auditor. Yeah. Just kidding. We don't have any, any details, rules, well, we'll outlines, anything that go along with it. It's done. And we actually have a process of when we move forward, when we go out to RFP for our auditor, how that process works. So section 609 of the charter specifically says we have an auditor. But beyond that, Which we do, yeah. who appoints, who makes yeah. the determination, who, who creates the contract, <clears throat> who reviews, who makes recommendations. Are we leaving that under the purview of the town manager or under the audit committee that we currently have? So, and actually, well, I'm going to check that for okay. the audit committee. So we'll pick that up. Uh, audit committee, uh, three members, uh, town council. So all three are town council. All three are town council members, correct. So it's basically a subcommittee of the council. Correct. And in that aspect, it would be under your purview. They would point what you would recommend. So the question is, do we go that route? Do we make it an outside agency of the town and have independent, or do we keep it on the council and get recommendation from that committee? Because the town I was looking at, and I don't recall which one it was, it was one out of 169. <laughs> so not Connecticut. That I'm sure. <laughs> um, and what it, they had uh, somebody that was a, an accounting major, a finance major. I mean, they were comfortable, uh, and they were reviewing the work of the auditing firm in behalf of the town, and then the processes that the town had on financial management. And, you know, they would review those and then make a re recommendation. They talk about amongst themselves privately, gave themselves independence, which the council allowed them to do. Right. 
because the council on their side, of the, and then they go back to the accounting firm. And then to go to your point, they did de deal with uh, bids, bidding the work uh, for the firm and um, writing the specs and things like that. I don't know how deep in the woods you want to get on this or how deep you think you have to, but it's language. Uh, that would be a question, yeah, because we don't, we don't have any requirements to, <clears throat> to it, so. It's fine that it's council members, but council members change possibly every two years. Right. So if they don't know what the process is going to be, now that's a relearning. Mm -hmm. And it may not be for two terms before we get to the point where we're in an RFP process again. Mm -hmm. And do we have them come forward? Do they review the audit prior to giving it to council? We don't have anything. Then the other two quick things, not to keep anybody any later than their day has been, but um, one is the staggered terms. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think that's that's like a, a very difficult thing to get your arms around uh, the way some towns run it. It's mostly with selectmen, to be honest with you. It seems right. to go hand in foot with a selectman form of government. Right. We do it with our board of fire commissioners. And board of fire commissioners. Um, I don't know how the council would feel about suggestion of three year terms and whether that would be workable. That was suggested to me by. Member of the public, <clears throat> uh, I couldn't find a three-year run except for a town in Maine, and they have uh, three-year terms. Um, and the people I talked to there are happy with it. Um, but they do a lot of skiing, so there you <laughs> they're go. happy a lot. <laughs> so if you were to review that, you would also need to look at Chapter Two Hundred One which yeah. specifically calls out that we hold them each odd number year yeah. in on Tuesday in November. Um, so we have to see how chart. that works with the parties in the registrar's office. And I'll tell you, I like the idea, like the premise of stagger terms. And I like the idea of a three instead of a two, just because you feel at, when you're newly elected, you feel like you're just getting your feet under you at the end of that first term. And, you, and then you have to run for election again. However, mm -hmm. If you do staggered, you'd be having a municipal election every election, every year, basically. Oh, that's hard work. And for the volunteers and committees in town, that would be really, uh, that would be a hardship for the Democratic and Republican town committees. One, to, 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 to put the fundraising, the, the uh, all of it, the volunteerism, all of it is very places. difficult every other year as well, it is right now. Places will be open no matter what. We have right. we hold an election right. every November, so They'd that's be, never yeah. an issue. It's the confusion to it's the that public. Local piece, yeah. And yes. oh. now the other issue that I discussed with the people in me was they compensate their council. Oh, uh, I only laugh because it's not a lot of money. I want a ten percent increase. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you'd be more insulted. I won't give you the number. You might be more insulted than encouraged. No, you know, a lot of people ask or assume like that we get paid. There's like $50 a meeting. Oh, that's interesting. First counselor. I've never heard of that. Up to a maximum of 500 bucks. I don't know what it was. <laughs> Assuming they're, they're taking you off like July and August, that's $50 a month. People usually assume that oh, we either get no, paid or we get a break on our taxes. Like there's, yeah. you know, veterans tax credits and um, elderly tax credits. People assume that if you serve in that capacity, you have a tax credit of some sort. So I always tell people. Imagine don't, how much interest that would get at your yeah, public you meeting when you have running. that. <laughs> you might you get more volunteers if that was the case. Oh, yeah. though, right? Yeah. Now that would bring some interest. We get a crowd here. <laughs> <laughs> you would get a crowd. Nancy, would you take care of that? Foot might be a lynch then? mom. I don't know. Yeah. So that was one thing. Uh, the other, the other last quick thing was what Weathersfield does. Say a very capable person like our mayor uh, were to be defeated, which isn't going to happen. But <laughs> if it did, and we lost her, then what do you do? And you know, it's happened to other candidates in the past, uh, less proficient than the mayor certainly. And then what do you do with that energy, and how do you replace it? Uh, and Weathersfield does where everybody runs for the council, it's my understanding, and then they chair, they elect a chairperson to run the council. They call him or she mayor, but it's a chairperson so that that person doesn't, if it had been a one-on-one, -on -one, that person might have gone away. I don't know if that's a real value system. I don't know how to measure that. Um, 
you know, you'd have to know who you're talking about for the candidate, whether they even want to, you know, it's, it's usually a populist person, that kind of a thing. But it was brought up by uh, some, one of the members of the public, too, that we've got uh, recorded. And that can be that can be difficult because yeah. as a town, I, you're used to voting for an individual for yeah. your mayor, where now you're leaving it to your elected council yeah, to I appoint like the highest vote yeah. getter or whoever it may be. No, I like the mayoral thing. I think it's a healthy thing. But we will work on the compensation side. As long as you don't say it came from me, because it did not. Sounds <laughs> like a new section in there. I'm not owning that one. <laughs> John brought them. <laughs> right before election. Yeah. Great. I just want to pass credit around. You know what I'm saying? I'm a, uh, Okay, before we get to public participation, uh, I want to go over the future meeting schedule. So did the month of April die? I wasn't made aware of it. Pretty much, yes. Uh, for me, I will be on vacation the week of the 11th. Good for you. Because God, I need it. Uh, Hope you're getting out me. of Dodge. <laughs> she's making me. Um, the issue we run into is we chose Tuesdays as our meeting date. Our first one is the town council's public hearing. The third one is the town council's budget adoption. Yeah, April budget season, we meet Makes on different. off weeks. We don't, yeah. yeah, we don't stick to our typical schedule. Yeah. I'm just concerned about momentum. Yeah. Um, I, I'm happy to meet on other days if everybody's available, say a Monday, a Thursday. Why don't you throw some dates at, at, at us? Okay. And, you know, I can meet on a Thursday. It's just it just has to be no earlier than seven. Seven would be yeah. I'd be able to get here for seven. Okay, and that's fine. That's you works know. for me too. Yeah. So okay. Mondays I'm off, but as long as it's during the week, no, you know, seven o'clock would be perfect. That was fine. Okay. Just because you know, yeah, I'd be concerned about momentum and uh, all the work. On the on the preparation of paperwork that has to be done once we come up with some recommendations. I mean, that's so if I was to go with anything, um, you know, seven. even if even if it's one that we could get together, if you can't squeeze out more than one, because but to miss everything, I think yeah. I don't know how the public would perceive it. I mean, yeah, and I agree with you on that. I, I was upset when we actually got to that point. Um, I would say we could look at either the 7th or the 21st. Um, even the 28th would be a possibility. Usually that last Thursday doesn't have any okay. meetings attached to it. Well, why don't we do this? I'll send out some and see what everybody's got. I'm collecting the, uh, the input from the commission on different things. Um, and if anybody wants to call me with an issue they like it, that's I'm fine with that as well. Put that together and try to come up with a consensus play, and where we differ will indicate that. And that would be maybe the discussion for the April meeting. Yep. That'll be the real hardcore work session. Getting down to the and then weeds. we can work out um, and just kind of a, uh, an office keeping issue. And to be fair to you, uh, would you want to us to recommend to outsource the preparation of? The report itself, or do you have no, time to? We can, we can put it together. Okay. Yep. I know you can, <laughs> but I'm giving you an opportunity to say no. Okay. We'll keep it in. We'll keep it in house all because right. we're all aware of what's happened. It's going to okay. take a lot longer to bring somebody else up to speed to do it. Because I have an old Underwood typewriter. I have an old Corona. It's about this big. It looks like a boat anchor. Oh, that's that's <laughs> worth something. Oh yeah. Okay, uh, public participation. Any member of the public wishing to speak? Anybody in the queue? We do have one person online. Okay. And that should be Ms. Lyons. Hi, Rose Lyons, 46 Hello. Elton Drive. Just a comment about the uh, requirements in order to remove someone from a board or commission. I attend several meetings and um, there's not many boards or commissions that I'm aware of that have specific requirements as to qualifications. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe James can correct me on that. But I hope that when you look at it, that there's some specific reasons 
given for removal because I have seen in the recent times with social media, there's been cries to remove this one and cries to remove that one because of something that was said or insinuated on social media. And I know that one actually went forward and didn't go anywhere because it's considered to be freedom of speech if you express your opinions on social media. Uh, sometimes it turns into a political, I don't like this guy on this board or commission, and if they say something wrong, they jump all over them. Or there's just people that just don't show up, too. And I think that the idea of maybe coming up with a percentage of the meetings that they do not attend is a good thing. It's hard to sit and watch people that show up find out that they can't go forward because they have no quorum. But I think it's a good thing to look at. But you have to be careful. It's a slippery slope in which you set the conditions in which someone can be removed or not. Okay, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Hi, Rose. If I may again, State your name and address, please. John. Bashan 56, Maple Hill. Uh, you got me interested in all these other things. I came with a very narrow focus, but I, I don't envy you for some of those uh, issues that you're going to have to debate. Some of them sound pretty tricky. Um, one recommendation I have, and I don't, I did just look quickly in there. Maybe we need a glossary of terms in the, uh, in the thing, but seriously, for this uh, special appropriation, what's a loan, what's a no, what's a, you know, um, you know, in that in that regard, I think it might be helpful. Most of the most of the um, um, charter I find fairly simple. It sounds like it was uh, written by farmers, and and at that time a lot of them were farmers. So I think it was made for the simple man like me. But some of it gets a little bit cloudy. Um, it's, and I think James uh, allayed my fears on that emergency meeting thing. Is I believe you said that there's different types of meetings, so they can have an emergency meeting and and that's it, that it, there's no delay. Um, as far as the cap on an emergency uh, ordinance or emergency spending, I, I guess I agree with Chris. Uh, he said, how can you have a cap? And technically, how could you have a cap? Because if you had an emergency that exceeded the cap, you'd still have to do it anyway. So, um, but, you know, I guess there should be some way to rein in, you know, um, ex excess spending. But again, we have to trust the people that we elect. Uh, and that goes back to that, um, the issue of the longer term for the mayor, I would fully support that because it seems like every time they get elected, they're right away, they have to run again. And uh, I would prefer to see a two-year budget myself too. So I don't know if that's even legal or possible because this every year, as soon as the budget is over, the, you know, a few months go by and then they're working on a budget again and it takes so much of their time. I don't know how they do it, to be honest with you. Um, the three-year mayor thing, I, I did a little quick research and, a lot, and some towns are doing it. Um, and even four years, up to four years, I think. I think I read that the average is actually three years. I, I could be wrong about that. Um, the residency thing, I guess we just have one person now that's required for residency. Isn't it just a town manager now? Yeah, so, I mean, I could think we could do away with that. This day and age with communications, you really can't be out of communication. So even if you wanted to be, you couldn't be. Um, and then, let's see, I had all these little notes here. So I'm just going to read you one quick thing, and this goes back, uh, you know, in Weathersfield. I don't, I'm not saying we should copy Weathersfield, but a lot of times we do look at what other towns do. So um, on their emergency um, ordinance, which is their 309, they, they and I, I don't have my reading glasses, but they use some really small numbers. So I'm, I'm wondering how accurate it could be because they mentioned something not to exceed 0.15%, which is a tiny number, you know, if you... That's, you know, one and a half tenths of a percent of our budget. That's not that much. Um, I don't know how to even do that. Uh, but and then in their obligatory referendum, which we're talking about, you know, if we're going to exceed that or if we're going to go with that moving target, the, the floating uh, thing, they do use. Um, I'll just read you the language real quick. Uh, no resolution authorizing the issuance of bonds, making special. Pro they mix the two of them, the bonds and the special appropriations. They they mix them together instead of keeping them separate. And it says uh, in excess of 0.3%. So again, not that much. Uh, the general fund appropriate expenditures, they, and they it's 0.3% of the general fund appropriated expenditures for the current fiscal year shall become effective until the same has been approved by a majority of electors uh, voting thereon in, in a regular election or special re uh, election uh, referendum. So 
<clears throat> there's this range. And if you go back to 309, um, there's three issues that 309, 310, and 311 are, are the things that I've talked about. And then they go back and they, they cut that in half. They go to 0 0.15, um, doesn't require um, special ordinance or anything. The council could spend it uh, at 0 0.3. It automatically goes to referendum. So they're in between our 375 to 975. Their in between amount um, is subject to the petition for referendum by the electors. So again, I know it's a nerdy little thing, but just bothers yeah, me. Yeah, no, good, good point. Yeah, <clears throat> thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We have uh, one more online. That would be Miss Foley. Go ahead, please. State your name and address. You there, Patty? <clears throat> Patty Foley, 51 Crown Ridge. Um, I want to go back to something Rose mentioned a little while ago, and you guys also, I think, touched on it. I think, Mayor, you touched on it, which was um, having been ill for um, a little while in my life, it made being on a commission here very difficult. So um, when we're considering removing somebody, um, we should also make sure that we deal with um, maybe a, a, an illness or a sickness issue. Um, and I know, uh, I, and I'm pleased the council is looking at the Environmental Commission, which is done through ordinance, which doesn't open up the charter. So I, it makes it much easier to take care of getting um, a quick, an expedient response to get it done. Yeah, it's a couple months, but it's a lot better than trying to go through something of this nature. Um, it, it just, it works out better. Um, it allows for, if it goes through an ordinance as opposed to the charter, it allows for uh, much more, uh, well, I guess expedient would be the word. Um, so that a commission can or could uh, evolve as as time is needed. I know that I know that's not every week everything of that nature. Um, but those are just a couple of things because we were stuck with um, not getting enough people to volunteer, which is everybody's problem. But we were also at the point where we had um, if one person who was on the environmental committee was um, on vacation, then had a meeting because we never had a quorum. So, um, which then reflects back to the Parks and Rec about having a quorum and making sure they can meet it. Because the environmental committee, not that long ago, was 11 people. And now down to seven, it's a much more manageable situation. So that has happened once before. I have nothing more to say, except uh, you got a lot of work ahead of you. And I'll, I'll try reading some more and I'll send my notes to you. But thank you so much for um, going through this so that we can have a workable document that all of us understand better. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Good night, Patty. Thank you. Anyone else? Pardon me? That is everyone. Okay. Can uh, comments by uh, commissioners? No, I think tonight was very helpful for, I think, all of us. We got a lot more, better overview of how to tackle this. Anything? No, just that I, I think that uh, seeing where there's you know ambiguity or multiple interpret ability to interpret the charter multiple ways, I think it's good that we're on this and hopefully we can address some of those issues. Chris, no, I'm good for now. I appreciate it. No problem. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So I'm going to make a motion. Moved and moved. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 We're adjourned. Thank you very much. We'll get back to you with the date in April.
and we'll make certain it's convenient to all of you. And um, I'll take up uh, what time left Mr. James has. <laughs> Spend a few minutes with him, go over some things, and uh, we'll put some thoughts and ideas together and uh, let everyone take a look at them and make their additions or deletions. And I'm certain we'll come up with a consensus package at that point. Uh, for a pre-draft kind of an issue, and then we'll keep working forward. Um, if anybody feels we should be meeting with any other department heads, let me know, and James will invite them if there's anybody else out there. And I would hope that the public will get more interested in this, but um, maybe we will have to create a little stimulus by putting some ideas together. My compensation for the town council. <laughs> All right.